All right, if you guys find your seats, we'll get started again. We're going to shift gears out of Daniel, and we're going to look at the life of Abraham. Gentlemen, we're, sending, we're, we're heading into Saturday, and we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be finishing up, and as soon as we're done here, we're going to have small groups, which uh, I'm really looking forward to. I love, I love men's retreats because it gets you to break down into smaller groups, and you actually get to know some of the people a little bit better. You guys know what I'm talking about? And I, I love the body of Christ and the way God uses everybody, and everybody has some input. So the, the last session of today is going to be basically coming together and talking about your observations, the things that you saw, the things that the Lord may have spoken to your heart about, um, some of the things that maybe, you know, I would, I would like to hear from you guys about that, because there are things that he'll reveal to you that maybe I didn't see. Or maybe there are things that, that I've seen that you haven't seen, or somebody next to you will have uh, an observation that you didn't see. And we all get stronger from one another, and that's the beauty of the body of Christ, to be able to do that. So if we're ready, I'm going to pray. Father, just as we move into talking about Abraham, I pray that you would help us, that as we go into your word, that it would find a place to reside in our hearts, that there would be good practical application. Lord, that you might use this to make us like you. So, Lord, be with our hearts and minds today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as we're, uh, as we're moving forward and talking about how God builds a man, we see even in spite of all the most difficult situations, Daniel was a kid that probably was brought up with good parents and taught the scriptures so that, I mean, he even has God in his name. And he got captured, taken away, and at a teenage life had everything taken from him and he served God faithfully and he was a light and a witness of his time. And if God can do that with Daniel, he can do that with us. Amen? Because we're not a product of our background. We're not a product of our genetics. We're not a product of our upbringing or our surroundings or our education alone. We are a result of what Jesus did on the cross. That's who you are. And that is truly your identity. All of those things may influence, you know, uh, my, my father was a, was a drunk and he had a really bad temper. That doesn't give me an excuse to be a drunk and have a bad temper, does it? Of course not. But it does influence me. And I've been educated in how to be deceptive. I've been educated in how to hurt people. I've been educated in a lot of ways. But it doesn't mean that I have to be that person. I am a result of what Jesus did on the cross. That's my identity. Everything else may be an influence, but if we're standing on the foundation of who Jesus is, he is our identity. And I want you guys to remember that. You're not, your identity isn't, yeah, well, you know, I grew up in a whatever family, and therefore you're the product of that. 
It doesn't work that way. Those things are influences, but they don't make you who you are. You are a result of what Jesus did on the cross. And I just hope that you have that identity firm in your heart. The way that God builds us and makes us into his image is kind of an interesting process. And every one of us that is walking with God has a testimony about things that God has taught us. And we tend to go through peaks and valleys. You guys go through peaks and valleys? Yeah, okay. So you're not always, hey, it's great. Yeah. But you're also not, you know, there are those valleys where we get desperate and um, we, we, can, we can reach some pretty decent lows, right? I mean, if, if the doctor tells you, sorry, you have cancer, you've got three months to live, you're going to feel that. And it's going to influence you. It doesn't have to make you anything, but it certainly will influence you, right? And suddenly all of your choices and all of your decisions will begin changing. And God does things like that in our lives. And as we go and as we go through, and some of these things are very traumatic, it forms us into the people that God is forging us to be. <clears throat> and so looking at the life of Abraham, you guys know Abraham is, is the first Jew, if you will. He's the, he's the father, the forefather of the whole Jewish nation. He was the one that God came to and made a promise. And he pulls him out of an idol worshiping family. And he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he becomes the father of all the faithful. Abraham is the one that the Pharisees were so proud to be related to when they were speaking to Jesus. You know, they're, they're saying, you know, Abraham's our father. And, you know, uh, they also said they were never uh, cap they were never held captive by anybody, which is baloney. Uh, but they said they identify very much with Abraham. And so you say, wow, that's great. Abraham's this great character. I remember reading the Bible and being introduced to Abraham. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I heard about this guy. Uh, and then I, I read through and I'm like, what? So this guy's a hero? He's certainly not Superman, right? But see, when you look over somebody's life, you may look at some of those things in the beginning, and then you have to look at the end product because Abraham is always pointing to this point in his life right here all of his life God was preparing him for this and he steps up so as we go through the life of Abraham and we look at him as a man we're going to see how God molds him changes him he falls down a lot of times you guys know about Abraham? He makes a lot of mistakes. I mean, when you look at a news story and you hear about a guy and a girl, they're walking through a neighborhood and a bunch of people gather around and um, they, they wanted to jump the bones of your girlfriend. And the guy said, yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. Go ahead. You would say, what? And yet that's what Abraham did. Twice. You hear about uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who um, basically has sex with his maid, and his maid gets pregnant and has a child, and he's going to cut her off and send her out of the house and not give her any child support or anything like that. And you say, oh, that's terrible. That's what Abraham did. Got his maid pregnant and then sent, him, sent her out of the house with his son. You know, so there are things that we see and looking through the lens of our culture, we look back and say, that's pretty messed up. You guys might have some of those things in your past. And the funny thing is, it's not something we should necessarily cover. It's something that we should tell people about. Because they might look at you and see the finished product and say, oh, you're such a good man. You're such a good boy. You're such a good Christian. But they don't know your background, right? They don't know how you got there. So tell them. Or else you'll be stealing glory from God. Anyway, I'm just saying. I'm going to say that a lot today. <laughs> Abraham, how God grows our faith. Now, he's called the father of the faithful. So he's the father of all of us, including Christians, because he's the father of faith. It says that 
this, of the scriptures that whatever things were written before times were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So that's what this story about Abraham is designed to do. That's why the Lord left it with us. That's why we have it in writing and it's in the scriptures. Abram is a remarkable, he's remarkable for just one thing. God called him and he responded. He believed God. That was the one thing that Abraham did that that's the thing that stuck after all of his years of life. That's what remains. And we talk about is that Abraham himself believed God and it was a righteousness. Abraham is revered in three world religions. He's mentioned 312 times in the Bible and he takes up one third of the book of Genesis. So you think there's something to be learned there, right? It takes up a lot of real estate. Abram is a unique is unique in a way that he is called the friend of God, right? Wouldn't you like to be called the friend of God? It's mentioned in more than one passage, and then they're up here on the screen for you. Abraham was a friend of God, and yet he's pretty messed up. <laughs> he's a friend of God. You know, people will always look at you, and they will judge God by you. You know that? They will judge Jesus that you preach by how you behave, by what you talk about, how your time is occupied, how you spend your money. It says here in chapter 12, we're introduced to Abraham, or actually it's Abram first, which means exalted father. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wow, that is a really big statement. God comes to him. He's a nobody. His parents worship the moon god, and he's nobody. And God says, I pick you. And he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. Jesus is looking for someone to show off through. Have you ever thought of yourself as a trophy of God's grace? You are a trophy of God's grace. And he wants to show you off. You think about that. It's a very quiet group today. Acts 7, 2-4 he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, get out of your country and out, out from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And he came out of that land of the Chaldeans and he dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved, with, uh, moved him to the land in which you now dwell. By the way, that's Stephen's sermon. If you remember Stephen, a deacon in the church in the beginning, they accused him of talking against Moses and, and they were basically because he believed in Jesus. And he looked like an angel and he had an opportunity to speak and he spoke on the whole history of Israel. And he started in the beginning and he came all the way down and he talked about Abraham and he talked about what he did and where he was and that God called him to Canaan. Said, I want you to go to Canaan. But where did he go? He went to Haran. He says, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your relatives. What did he do? He took his father, Terah, and he took his nephew, Lot. God said, I want you to leave everything, and I want you to go where I tell you. He neither went alone, nor did he go to the place that God called him. Now, if you're just reading through here, you may not notice that. But he didn't go to Canaan like God told him to. He went to Haran. It was a property of one of his relatives. And he brought his father with him until his father died. Then when his father died, he actually was fully <laughs> obedient to God, and he went into Canaan. And I wonder, have you ever had that experience? God called you to do something, and you kind of... You have no idea the things I struggle with. <laughs> you kind of one-cheek it. You know, you half-step it. 
you you don't do the full thing to God. It's kind of like what God told me to do, you know. It, instead of sharing the gospel, I said, God bless you. You know, so that's kind of this, like being obedient to God. And I don't know if you've ever, how many of you have ever pulled a half measure? You pulled it? Okay, good. That's great. All right. So your quietness is guilt. All right. Well, good. Well, I'm the same way. There are a lot of things that I do that I don't do necessarily 100% like Jesus. And I think I'm like Abram. I think God is trying to grow my faith. But how patient God is with Abram. Because he says, I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you. Come out of your family. I want you to leave everything and come. And Jesus tells us the same thing, right? You know, there are some of us that live in Haran. There are some of us who have been called to do something else. And instead of doing the something else that God has called us to, we're living somewhere that we're not supposed to. We're doing things that God hasn't asked us to do. But we're doing it for now until, you know, we, we do the very thing that God wants us to do. God is so patient. And, you know, you have to look through the lens of Bible time. Okay. You and I, we look through like our calendar and we look at, you know, what's going on this week, what's happening this weekend, what's happening next weekend. We might even get, you know, go three months out and already have plans for three months from now. You know, God looks through Bible time. A day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day. God is trying to accomplish something in Abram's life and he's being patient with him. He's being gracious with him, just like you just like me. So I, I don't want to seem like, you know, oh, Pastor Dave, you're pretty judgmental on Abraham there. No, I'm just reading the scripture and I'm seeing myself. I hope you do as well. So he goes and he didn't fully obey. Now, how come? How come he didn't fully obey God? I think he was too attached to his father. I think he was too attached to Lot. In Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, it says, And by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place in which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. How many of you don't know where you're going? <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. He didn't know where he was going. But by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him the same promise. For he waited for a city in which its foundations, whose builder and maker are God. The funny thing is, you'll, you'll read through that passage in Hebrews, and it's like, man, this guy is a, a, a stellar hero of the faith. He went into the promised land, but did he go in the promised land immediately? No. Was he a fully finished person from the beginning? No. God built him along the way, and, and faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the bigger it gets, the stronger you get in your faith as you practice this and use it. And it's interesting because God gives us faith, but then he entrusts us and he tells us what to do with it. And we're supposed to put it into action and believe God like Abraham did, right? And so why doesn't it mention that in, in Hebrews? <laughs> well, I don't know. When you get to heaven, why won't God mention your sins? When you get to heaven, your sins aren't going to be mentioned because they're covered under the blood, right? The New Testament is like that. We're, we're going to look at God's finished product. We're not going to look at the process necessarily. You and I are all still stuck in the process. Amen? Amen. So you might be the kind of a person that beats yourself up because you fell short in some way. Don't do that. Come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Offer repentance. And walk in newness of life. That's the answer. Don't stand around beating yourself up. There are so many people that are bound up with the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. You know, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. Like, I should have done that. I could have done that. Well, if only I would have done that. And there are people that are bound up in that. Look at Abraham. He's a knucklehead. He's just like you. We're all in process. Hopefully... You're in process. Amen? Amen? Nahor, one of his relatives, he ends up building a city. And Abraham, the only, only thing he builds is altars. Because God 
is calling him to the promised land, and so he's living kind of a nomadic existence. And so instead of building a city and settling down, what he does is he builds altars. Are you building altars, or are you building a city? There was a time I went and moved out to Pennsylvania, went to Bible college and all of that, and when I finally got my feet under me and I, I got a couple dollars in the bank, I bought a building. It was a church. It was built in 1867. It's 9,000 square feet. I don't know if you guys know how big that is. I played volleyball in my living room. It was 45 by 42 with a 23-foot ceiling. One room, no beams. My wife would lead aerobic classes in this room. That was our living room. <laughs> it was a gigantic house. You know what happened? I started to build a kingdom on earth. And the Lord told me one time, why don't you get out of that house? Why don't you leave Pennsylvania and go back to New Jersey? What? Back to New Jersey. That's like, you know, remove all filthy language from your mouth, the scripture says. It's like one of those things. Go back to New Jersey. Land of tolls and taxes? I've been through this. I wonder if you've been through this. Has God ever spoken to you and said, get the heck out? Leave it all. Well, oh, that's unreasonable. I can't do that. This is how God builds people. When you let go of everything and then be obedient to the thing that God's called you to do, he can do great things. But if not, you're going to find that you're not living up to your fullest potential. Is it possible to not live up to your fullest potential? Look at Samson. Is it possible? Psalm 103, 10 to 14 says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> Nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. And aren't you grateful for that? It doesn't give you an excuse used to camp there but it does give us a reason to hope that things can change because we have a loving God Jesus made it clear what our priorities should look like in Luke 9 57 to 62 Jesus said this now <clears throat> it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him Lord I will follow you wherever you go and Jesus said to him Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Well, that, that sounds like Abraham, right? And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but... Let me first go and bid them farewell who are in my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Man, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? Jesus wants everything. He doesn't want your leftovers. He doesn't want your extra time. He wants all your time. And he deserves it, doesn't he? Keeping him first is a, is a difficult thing. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily and follow me, which means I don't have a right to hold on to anything for myself. I, I know of some people who have done that in the Bible and it didn't work out well for them. God first calls, we obey, and then he blesses. And you can see that with Abraham. He tells him to get out of his country and do all this, and you don't see him come and bless Abraham until he gets back in this country, until he gets to where he's supposed to be. And then the Lord shows up and speaks to him. You don't hear about him speaking to him when he's gone. Same thing with David. You remember David, he, he goes into this 
he goes into this town in the Philistine territory and he's kind of off grid and he's off road and he's not seeking the Lord. You don't see him having a communication with God at all when he's in the Philistines. And he's just living, he's living like a fleshly man. They're, they're going and they're killing people and uh, taking stuff and that's what they're doing out in the Philistine territory. You don't see him calling on God at all and you don't see God speaking to him until the town gets invaded and all of their wives and children and all their stuff's gone and his own men are trying to kill him. That's when he calls on God and that's when God speaks to him. Because if we're not going to be obedient to do that which he's already given, why would he give us any more information? Why would he give us any more direction if we're not being obedient to the thing he's already showed us? Make sense? That's the way God is. And so you got to pack everything up and go. There may, there may be some people, places, or things you may have to leave before you receive the promised blessings of God. It might be that you're hanging on to stuff that you're not supposed to hang on to. Certainly there's enough stuff on that RV to give suggestions. <laughs> Leaving everything looks more like this picture. When it's only you can take what you can carry. I'm at the age where I'm starting to think about what my kids are going to have to divide up, clean up, throw out when I die. So I'm starting to offload stuff. I'll be having a garage sale, so I'll, I'll let you know. I mean, I have multiples of things that I, 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 have, I have tools I don't even use anymore. I have tile saws. I have multiple compound miter saws. I have, I, I have a hammer for any possible job that you would have. I have at least 10 of them. I have at least 15 caulking guns. I've got, I've got stuff. I got stuff on top of my stuff. I have wrenches in multiples that I don't need. Shame on me. Garage sale. Because I can't be mobile and I can't respond to God if I'm tied down to a bunch of stuff. And stuff can't be the reason I live. It can't be the reason you live either. So Abram departed, from, departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. How would you like to enter into ministry at 75? That's the beginning. That's the way I felt. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed for, uh, from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. They acquired people in Haran. See, they were settling in for the long haul. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they finally, once Terah dies and he plants him in Haran, then he's free of his familial obligations. By the way, our biggest familial ob obligation is to our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Scripture does say if you don't take care of your earthly family, you're worse than an unbeliever. But it better be in obedience to what God's telling you to do. Right? Yes. So learn to let go and leave. You know, there are things that we need to leave. I mean, how many of you have left friends? Praise God. That's, that's a hard thing to do. How many of you have left jobs? Okay. How many of you left houses? Yeah. Job opportunities, um, six-figure salaries. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we leave. And you know what those things are? Those things are blessings that we leave at the foot of the cross, and we do it as a sacrifice of praise unto our God. It's not lost. It's just sent ahead. Romans 4, 16 to 25, speaking of, therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead, and he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body 
already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving, hope, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted, or accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and he was raised because of our justification. You see, Abraham and everything that he went through and him holding fast to his faith is an example, and it's written as an example for us, including all the shortcomings. Because, my goodness, you read about Daniel, nothing bad ever written about Daniel. You read about Joseph, nothing bad, really bad, written about Joseph. And then you look at Abraham, who's acclaimed to be this really great pillar, and he's not doing everything exactly the way he should. But it's been written down so that we understand God is gracious, and I'm glad for that. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place in which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him with the same promise. And he waited for a city which foundation and builder was, maker was God, like us. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to receive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Do you remember what Sarah did when she was told she would have a child? Laughed. She laughed. And guess what they called the kid? Laughed. Laughter. Well, <laughs> you see, they're talking about the finished product, not the process. Innumerable is the sand by the seashore. And these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These are people who have gone before and showed us, hey, you see all this stuff? Don't do that. You see this? Do that. It's, it's a great little map, right? The scriptures. Just to give you a quick overview of Abram's life. He was Abram, and then God gave him a new name, Abraham. He put a little in there. Then he took Sarai and he made her Sarah. He put a little, that little breath right there is part of the name of God. So he's putting a stamp on them, if you will. In Genesis chapter 12, he's called to Canaan, but he goes to Haran. He's called to leave, but he brings his father and Lot. He brings his father and his father ends up dying. He then goes into the promised land, except he goes into the promised land and there's a real problem there. They're in the middle of a drought. Well, this is the very thing that God told him to do, was go there. He goes there and there's a drought. So you know what he does? He goes to Egypt. <laughs> hey, I did what God wanted me to, to do and it didn't work out for me, so I left. Did any of you have that experience? I did. I tried once. I tried sharing the gospel with my sister once and she, she shut me down. I did that once. You know, it's like having a bad meal. I don't stop eating. <laughs> anyway, there's a famine in Canaan. He goes to Egypt. He lies to Pharaoh and he loses his sister. You see, he went to Canaan, except things were kind of hard in Canaan. He's like, eh, it, things are good in Egypt. Let's go. Egypt is always a picture of the world. So he goes to Egypt. And Pharaoh hears from his guys, yeah, there's a new chicken town. Did you check her out? She's pretty hot. And he goes, Jewish? Yeah, I don't have one of those. I got to collect one of each. And so he says, bring her in. They go up to Abraham. Hey, Abraham, um, who's this? Oh, she's my sister. Because you see, they had a problem with adultery, but they didn't have a problem with murder. And so what they would do is they say, oh, she's your wife? No problem. Kill you, I'll take your wife. So he says, she's my sister. And so instead, what he got was a bunch of gifts, money and stuff, like a dowry. And so he sells his wife because somebody's interested. And then God touches all of those people in, uh, in Egypt with infertility. It's 
some pretty crazy stuff. God shut it down so that Pharaoh wouldn't lie with her. And so God has to come to Pharaoh in a dream and he rebukes Abram through a non-believer. Can you, can you imagine that? If somebody knocked on my door and was an unbeliever and they said, God told me that you lied to me. <laughs> and if it happens to be Pharaoh himself that calls you on the carpet, can you imagine? God speaking to a non-believer because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. She's not your sister. She's your wife. And God was going to wipe him out. He goes, Pharaoh, you're a dead man. What do you mean? The woman that you, you have in your house, she's married. Oh, I didn't know. You're going to kill an innocent man and a whole bunch of people with me? Come on, God. Who do you think you are? Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> but he understood. He says, I did this in the innocence of my hands. He goes, that's why you haven't touched her yet. I prevented that. So Pharaoh goes and he goes, listen, take stuff. Here, take all this stuff. And he gives him people. People? Yeah. It was a commodity back then. One of those people is going to be a problem. Her name's Hagar. She's an Egyptian maidservant that was given to him from Pharaoh when he lied. And he was in a place he shouldn't have been doing things he shouldn't have been doing. Just like Lot. He brings Lot up to Haran. He brings him to Canaan. He brings him over into the promised land. He brings him back to Canaan, and he has trouble with Lot every turn because he's not supposed to be with them. Lot gets exposed to Sodom, the well-watered valleys of Sodom. And Abram says, listen, we got too much stuff, you and me. Our, our herdsmen are arguing. We've got problems. We don't have enough pasture land here. Uh, Abram, being the big man, says, listen, you choose where you're going to go. If you go right, I'll go left. If you go left, I'll go right. You choose whatever land you want. And it says that Lot looked and he saw the well-watered valleys of Sodom. He goes, that's where I'm going. And Abraham said, no problem. I'll take the desert-like area over here. So Abram does a good thing. But Lot now is exposed to all kinds of immorality. And it ruins his life. Because I don't think he should have been there. He never should have dragged Lot with him. Sometimes you drag people with you that you shouldn't be dragging with you. And our compromises have side effects. So he goes back to Bethel, which is the house of God, back to the beginning. And he strives with Lot and they part because of their prosperity. Can you imagine? You know, both our businesses are doing so well, we really need to move apart. God renews his promises when Lot is gone. God comes to him and he tells him, yeah, you remember that promise I made? I'm going to make you, your children are going to be like the stars of the sky, the sea, you know, the sand on the seashore. And he renews his promise once Lot's gone. It's interesting. If you're wondering why God hasn't spoken to you recently, maybe you're holding on to something you shouldn't be holding on to. That's the lesson I learned. If I feel like I'm far away from God and he's not speaking to my heart, I'm wondering, is there something in my life maybe that I'm holding on to that I should let go of? I see it to be a, a pattern, right? So, after that, Lot gets in trouble in Sodom. Gee, what a surprise. Next chapter. Abraham has to go and rescue them all. And in so doing, he meets this guy named Melchizedek, where it would just be like a one-line mention through the scripture if it wasn't for the New Testament, where Paul makes a big deal out of Melchizedek and likens him unto Christ. He comes out and he brings bread and wine. Hmm, that sounds familiar. And he has a meal with Abram and he blesses him. He's also a priest and a king, which is kind of weird because those two offices don't mix. So it's this interesting guy that he gets to meet and it's because he did the right thing. And the king of Sodom says, listen, I want to give you a bunch of stuff for delivering us. He goes, I don't want a penny from you. He says, I know that if I take money from you, you're going to boast later. You're going to say, well, Abram's so rich because we made him rich. We gave him all that money and stuff when he came and rescued us. And he goes, I, I don't want it. He says, you keep it. Just make sure my men are fed, my fighting men. He had, he had over 300 fighting men in his own family. He had his own private army. He had his own militia. That's how big Abraham was. <clears throat> so he goes and he takes care of Lot because Lot's in deep trouble. 
In chapter 15, God officiates a visible covenant with Abraham. He now is renewing this. And you know, with the split animals and God moving through with the torch and the... Of course you do. Sorry, don't mean to bore you. Chapter 16, you got Hagar and Ishmael. Sarah has this great, di great idea. You know, God made a promise to you that you're going to have all these descendants. Maybe he meant for you to have sex with our maid. And you know what Abram said? Okay. Well, jerk. It was a huge mistake. And of course she gets pregnant. She has a child. They name him Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of all the Arab countries. And guess who's still mad at Israel? Ishmael. Hagar and Ishmael. Now, Genesis 17, Abram, Abraham he's now has a new name, and Sarai, or Sarah, is 90. They get new names, and there's a renewal of the promise. And of course, when he's told it's going to happen, he laughs. He's the first one to laugh, by the way. The Lord tells him, you're going to have a son, and he laughs. <laughs> You got to be kidding me. You mean I, I slept with the maid and I have a son and he's not really considered my son because it's through the maid? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. And he laughs and he's like, listen, we did this once. Isn't that enough? He was 75 when God initially made the promise. He's now 99. Can you imagine waiting 25 years for God to fulfill a promise? Have any of you had to wait a long time before God fulfilled his word to you. Amen. You see, this is a pattern. God works these things and makes us strong in faith through these ways. And sometimes it's waiting. God has a timing that only he knows and understands. Sometimes we have to wait a long time. He waits. And he laughs, which means he doubts. And everybody gets circumcised. Yay, let's have a circumcision party. <laughs> the, the sign of circumcision is given to Abraham in this chapter. And so everybody in the house gets circumcised. Everybody. Everybody, 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 everybody. You know, the males anyway. <laughs> and in Genesis 18, we have this wonderful angelic visitation. And there are these three visitors. One of them is not an angel. Two of them are. And they sit down with the Lord, and the one says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back in a year's time, and, and Sarah is going to be pregnant with a child. And she's in the tent, and she goes, <laughs> he goes, hey, why did Sarah laugh? He goes, oh, no, Sarah didn't laugh. Oh, yeah, she did. <laughs> I love that. Oh, yeah, she did. She laughed. You're lying to me. <laughs> be back in a year, and she's going to have a child. So, so what are you guys doing today? Oh, well, we're going down to Sodom to see if it's as bad as what we hear, if the outcry to the Lord is, is true. And so the two angels leave, and they go to bring judgment down on Sodom because of their many sins. The Lord stays back, and he goes, shall we keep it a secret what we're about to do with Abraham? He says, yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're decimating the city. Judgment's it's come. They're, they're at their fullest. It's time to bring them down. And Abraham says, what? He goes, certainly you wouldn't destroy the city for 50 righteous people. If there's 50 righteous people in the city, would you destroy the city for 50 righteous? Certainly you would never do that, God, right? He turns into a Yiddish man from Brooklyn. <laughs> and he says, no, for the sake of 50, I wouldn't. Well, what about 10 less? What if there's 40? No, if there's 40, I wouldn't destroy the city. Well, what about half that? What if there's 20? No, 20, I wouldn't destroy the city. Well, what about 10? He says, if there are 10 righteous people in that city, I won't destroy the city. And that's where Abraham stopped. Because he figured, certainly, there's got to be 10 righteous men there. There's got to be 10 righteous people in this city. Guess what? Nope. The angels go. They lay hold of Lot, his daughters, his wife. And they forcibly remove them from a place where a riot breaks out. Because all the men in the city have surrounded the house. And they want to rape the angels. 
Every man from young boy to old man had surrounded the house wanting to have sexual relations with the angels in Lot's house. And Lot, a real prize, says, listen, I got a couple daughters that are virgins. Why don't you take them? And they didn't want them. <laughs> that tells you what's going on in Sodom. The angels blind everybody. They get the heck out of Dodge. As they're going, you know, Lot's wife turns around, turns into a pillar of salt. He's left with his daughters. As they're running away, the angels say, listen, run to the hills because we can do nothing until you are safely away. And he goes, well, wait a minute. The mountains? What about that city right over there? It's a little city. See how small it is? It's just a nothing city. Why don't we go in there? And they said, well, you better get the heck out of here because we can't do anything until you're gone. And so once they go into this little city, they bring down judgment upon Sodom. And they burn it up with sulfur. It's interesting. It's a sulfur plain. And if you look at the archaeology of it, it's, it's amazing. And they were all destroyed. Sodom's daughters, it, while, while they fled Sodom, Lot's daughters say, there is not a man on the face of the earth that will reproduce with us. They just went to a city. Why do they say that? Because that city's just like Sodom. Men aren't interested in women. They dress like women. And so they, he says, we got to get out of here. And they leave. The daughters seduce their father, and each of them has a child. This is where the Moabites and the Ammonites come from. The Moabites and the Ammonites, the arch enemies of Israel, all because of Lot being dragged around. Have you ever look back on your life with the shoulda, coulda, wouldas? I hope that who you are today isn't, isn't anything like the person you once were, especially when it comes to him. So then he goes to Gerar. So he moves out of the area and he goes to Gerar and he does the same thing with Abimelech. Who's, who's the leader of Gerar. And he says, this is my sister. And he goes, oh, she's pretty hot. I'll take her into my house. You see, there's no such thing as a pass or fail with God. There's a pass or do over. He gets another opportunity to tell the truth and he doesn't. And he lies again. And the same exact thing happens. Uh, there are a lot of scholars that look at it and say, oh, it's the same event. No, it's not the same event. Two different people, two different names, two different times. Well, how could he blow it twice? Do you know human beings? <laughs> he lies to Abimelech and Gerar. God speaks. And, and he has to, Abimelech has to correct Abraham. The same exact pattern as he did when he was over in Egypt. In chapter 21, Isaac is finally born. The son of promise, laughter, is born. Finally, 25 years later, God fulfills his promise to Abraham as he said he would. And they have Isaac, except everything is not so great because Ishmael and his mom, Gomer, are, I'm sorry, not Gomer, Hagar. I always think of Hagar as a cartoon character, but Hagar. And they're mocking Sarah and her son, Ishmael, uh, Isaac. And so they're mocking them. And Sarah says, listen, you got to get rid of this woman. Well, it was your stinking idea for him to have sex with her, and what's the matter with you? Anyway, if she were here, but it's a men's retreat. Anyway, so she says, she's got to go, and, and him too. And Abraham prays about it, and the Lord says, yeah, they need to go. Loads them up with some food and some water and sends them out, and they have a, there's a whole thing, and God makes a promise, don't worry about it. You're going to be a great nation too. You're going to have 12 princes, which they have 12 princes. Very interesting. Just like Jacob's sons, there are 12 princes also um, with from Ishmael. So all of that happens with Abimelech. And then Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is the height of what God has been preparing Abraham for all of his life. He says, I want you to take your son, your only begotten son, I want you to take him to a mountain where I will show you. And there I want you to 
sacrifice him to me as a whole burnt offering. Okay, God, you promised me the son, waited a long time, I made a bunch of missteps and stuff, but do I really need to kill the boy? Yes, kill the boy. Would God ever ask you to give something to him that he gave to you that is so precious? And since when does God believe in human sacrifice? Do you ask these questions as you, you, you walk through the scriptures? And so it says, the next morning, he mounted his donkey, he took his son, he gathered the wood, they had to take fire, live fire, because they didn't have an aim and flame. He jumps on the donkey with some servants and they go to Mount Moriah. He tells the servants to stay at the bottom of the mountain, and they do. And he says, I and the son will go up and worship. That's the first time worship is used in the scripture. The boy and I will go up and worship. By the way, he's in his early 30s. So all of the Sunday school pictures, you see him being a little boy. It's not the case. Abraham's an old man. He's 100 years old. But he's walking up this mountain. The boy asks, Father, we have the wood and the fire, but where's the sacrifice? The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. That's exactly how it's worded in the Hebrew. The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. He goes up, ties up his son, puts him on the altar, raises the knife, and he's ready to do it. And he's one second away from doing it, and an angel from heaven comes and stops him, says, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, now I know that your heart is true. But he wasn't always that way, was he? And he said, there's a, there's a ram caught in a thicket in the sticker bush and his, with his horns, which is very reminiscent of Jesus on the cross, right? And I want you to take him in place. And it says that Abraham comes down from the mountain and he meets with his slaves at the bottom and then they go home. It never mentions Isaac. It's not that he's not alive and it's not that he's not there, but he's not mentioned. The next time you hear Isaac mentioned in the scripture, it's when Rebecca is being introduced to him, his bride where an unnamed servant went and got a bride for Isaac. That mountain you know as Mount Calvary, where Jesus was sacrificed. The reason that Isaac isn't mentioned is because I think it's a perfect picture of Jesus once he's resurrected. The next time that Jesus will be with us is when we as the bride will be introduced to him. All of Abraham's life was pointing to this time. And I wonder, God has been building you as a man for what? This was definitely the Super Bowl, right? And all of the training and all of the stuff that God was building into him through this process was to get him to the place where this would be a perfect picture of Jesus Christ who would come one day and give his life for the sins of the world. I wonder, could God be crafting and building and molding you for something? Something that's bigger than you've ever done. Something that is still waiting out there. But you need to be in shape, right? Because nobody just goes to the Super Bowl without training. God builds men the same today as he always has. It's through challenges and it's when we fall and God catches us and we learn and sometimes we make mistakes more than once and God picks us up and he shows us grace and he's training us all along. There are things that we need to leave. There are things that we need to push out of our lives. There's compromise that has to stop and there's a full dedication that he wants from our heart and that's when he will come and confirm his promises to you. That's when things will happen. You guys know probably some of my story. And when I was a young man, I was lost. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I caught fire. 
The word was exciting to me when it was just an ancient relic and a paperweight. And suddenly it meant something to me. And I began to grow in the Lord. And I felt God's calling eventually to be a pastor as a young man in my 20s, my early 20s. I met, a, I met a girl, we got married, we had a child, I finished my military uh, obligations, and I said, I think God's called me to be a pastor. And so I talked to a pastor about it, he goes, well, then you need to go to Bible college. But you better hunker down and get ready for a good eight years worth of education. What? <laughs> I'm in my early 20s. I got a wife. I ended up having two kids by the time I was done, I went to Bible college. I had to leave some people. I had to leave everything. I worked a full-time job, and I went to school full-time, and I was married. And I was a father of two children. That's nuts. Got through it, praise God. I figured as soon as I get out of college, I'm going to get me a job as a pastor. Start paying off that student loan. I didn't become a pastor until I was a, a pastor of a church until I was 50 years old. So when I look at my life, I see Abraham. All of that. Yeah, thank God. I, I got the short one. I got the shorter version. Praise God. But when God spoke to me when I was 20 years old, and I felt like he called me to be a pastor. It didn't happen until I was 50. That's 30 years. But let me tell you, men, what happened between those points was vital for me to be here. Abraham wouldn't be Abraham if he didn't go through everything he went through. Failures, warts, and all. You would not be you if you didn't go through all the things that you went through. Warts and all. This is how God builds men. This is how he builds the character of Jesus Christ in our life. This is the process of sanctification. And he's done it for other men, and he's going to do it for us, guys. We're on that same road. Amen? Yes. I'm going to let you guys go right now, and you're going to go into small groups. You have a color on your tag, and your leaders have um, the same color as, as uh, you. And so find your leader. If you're blue, you're with Randy. Randy, where would you guys meet? Nursery. You guys are going to be in the nursery. So all of you childish people. John Graham. Green? John, where are you going to be meeting? Right over here in the corner. If you have a green folder, you're going to be meeting with John Graham. So you guys can kind of get up and go on over there if you want to. Uh, red is um, Dino Amarini. Dino? Dino, where are you going to be meeting? Where? You're over here, Dino. Dino's over in this corner here, so if you have a red folder and you're on the red team, you'll be meeting over here with Dino and the boys. Sean, Sean, you're yellow or purple? You're yellow. Sean is yellow. Sure. Uh, Sean, um, what about the fellowship hall? Or the first classroom? All right. Any of you have a yellow folder, follow Sean. Anybody have purple? Any of you have purple? You're going to be with my brother Pete in the back? Johnny, you're orange? Johnny D's orange. If you've got an orange folder or an orange tag, you're with Johnny D. Where are you going to be meeting? The first classroom as you go down the hall.